And the uh, next speaker is already uh, wired up. Um, it's uh, Paul Skinner. Paul Skinner comes from a totally different angle. He has been uh, educated as an uh, experience designer and since 2013 is uh, working for a company based in Amsterdam but also in New York called Tellart. And Tellart is uh, specializing in uh, experiential experiences, um, dealing a lot with uh, the future of what we do, how we live, um, dealing a lot with technology. And uh, this is exactly the subject that Paul will address today. So we are surrounded nowadays by all kinds of new technologies, as Dominique also pointed out. Uh, there's more coming. Uh, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, uh, synthetic biology. Do we actually want this future to be there? Paul, please come to the stage and give us your vision and your opinion. A warm applause for Paul Skinner, please. Hello. Hello, hello. Okay, let me orient myself. Oh, this is very peculiar. To so take off my headphones and hear myself in real life again. Oh wait, I can hear myself through that. So welcome, thank you so much for having me here. Um, as uh, Robert introduced, my name is Paul Skinner. I'm a creative director at Talat. Um, we're a very small uh, design consultancy uh, global uh, design consultancy that's um, started off in the east coast of America. Uh, we do exper we make experiences. We make experiences of all kinds. In fact, we're industrial designers, um, but experience design, of course, is a massively wide thing. So, I'm very glad to share some thoughts about some of the work that we've been doing and what it means to be exploring the future. Technology versus humanity, of course, is a really, really, uh, yeah, like polar, you know, is it really that simple, technology versus humanity? And when I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think about my son that's uh, 10 weeks old today, uh, sorry, yesterday, and has been keeping me up at night and preventing me from writing this talk. Um, what is it going to be like for him? What, what, are, what is his life going to be like uh, for the next 35 years until, until um, he's my age? It's quite possible that he's never going to learn to drive. Mobility for him is going to be a very, very different thing, as we've just seen, from what it was for us in our lives. Will he have to work at all? We don't know. Is AI going to um, automate so far that like, a lot of people aren't going to have to work at all and governments instead are going to start providing universal basic incomes for us all? Um, will he need to use a pen? Will he need to write? Will he use, even use a keyboard? Is everything going to be dictation via one of these things? Or even further, will he even need a microphone? Um, it's very difficult to see um, in today's world what is still the realm of science fiction. Science fiction, as we speak, as I'm talking right now, is becoming science fact. It's no longer the case that we're just imagining these things. Facebook announced just recently that they're developing advanced brain computer interfaces that mean that we won't have to type anymore. We're going to have to just think. Um, and, and they even say in their presentation that this is leading into the kind of fluid interface that's required for AR. And of course, anyone that's watched Black Mirror knows that science fiction takes advantage of these rapid developments in technology really easily, you know? This, this, is, a, um, this is a rather dystopian view uh, of... Um, I can't hear any sound, but like, this is a dystopian view of what happens when a chip is implanted into uh, the back of your neck so that the brain is, the, your brain is being read and your thoughts are being understood. Of course, okay. it, doesn't, uh, it isn't just that you can type like without a using a keyboard. Over. Actually, if is the brain is able to understand that? everything yeah. and it's an input yep. device and yeah. an output device, then your perception can be controlled completely as well. Holy and it's really difficult Holy to know shit. what right. is going to be real. Right. Um, in fact, this episode is really worth watching. It's called Playtest. This is just the beginning of it. And it gets pretty crazy when you can actually be controlled fully and your perception is, is no longer clear what is real. Um, that's a very dangerous world. But for me, this isn't about. Um, for me, this isn't about. Uh, sorry, I'll go back. For me, this isn't about um, uh, brain-computer interfaces or even gaming, just per se. This is about our submission to who is designing our future. 
who is actually choosing the future that we're going to have as a society? And what does that mean for humanity? And of course, that is the situation that we all found, find ourselves in these days. We're in a very strange present. Suddenly, everything is a computer. The internet is everywhere. Artificial intelligence is going to be all around us. The political systems and the um, banks and everything that we've depended on is, are all changing super rapidly. We're at a huge point of inflection. And it's really difficult, as we just heard, to predict what's going to be next. So in the 80s, um, the US uh, Army War College, which is training military officers about strategy, started talking about this term VUCA. And um, they're describing this, they're dis using this to describe the state of the economy and the, uh, sorry, they're using this to describe a battlefield, but it's been absorbed into the rest of the world as a way to describe the economy and business and society at large, because it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Everything is changing. We don't know which way is up anymore. It's really difficult to get a, a solid ground. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Is there going to be, you know, are the, are the products and services and ways that I live my life going to be completely different in a way that I couldn't predict? Everything is mutually dependent. The complexity is very, very illegible. And when we are talking about um, our submission uh, to these technologies that are appearing all around us every day, we have to remember that this this... Like, who, who's behind all of these things? This guy here is the character in this, in this uh, film who's the owner of the game um, company. He's, he's the one who's pushing us in that direction, and, and this guy is just submitting to his will. But what does this games company want? And actually, it's much bigger than that. You know, like, at every turn, um, AI is outperforming humans these days. This is uh, Google's AlphaGo that recently conquered humans at the last remaining strategy game that we thought we were the best at. It, it, you know, it knocked us out. And that's everywhere. Not only is AI going to be doing these super specific tasks, but in fact, it's going to be on all the time. It's going to be in every pocket. It's going to be on every corner. It's going to be watching you and listening to you. And we've got to remember that these systems are ecosystems, as we've just heard. Google and Amazon and Facebook and all of these enormous data collectors know everything about us already. But what happens when they're launching products which are going to be always on, where the AI is the thing which is deciding uh, which photos are the ones worth taking? It's, it's listening to you all the time. And this is arriving on, um, on our shelves very, very soon. And of course, there's this huge debate about what are we going to do uh, when robots are going to be better at everything than us? All of us. This is Elon Musk. He's our, uh, he's our technology savior. He's pushing amazing things out into the world. And yet he doesn't know. He's like, I am really scared of this. I have no idea how it's going to be. Um, so where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? Is, is this a future that we want? Uh, and, and what can we do about it? So this is a quote from William Gibson that we love to talk about because it, it's in his book, Pattern Recognition. And it says, uh, basically, that uh, the idea of uh, being able to clearly imagine a future was a luxury of a past time. Actually, we don't have, like, so much is changing all around us that we have insufficient now to stand on. The now, it, it doesn't exist anymore. We have no future because our present is too volatile. And a chaotic present robs us of what, this, what these visions can be. It's disempowering. Like, how do we get to choose when we don't know what the now is. My clicker is. So, so the bigger question is, is rather than like, do we, do we want this future? It's what future do we want and how to get to imagining what kind of futures we want. And so I want to talk about a project we've been doing in Dubai, which is a really, really fascinating journey for us. And it's really transformed the way we think about our practice. Um, so field notes from the future. And Dubai is a, a really important context for us. Uh, it's, an inc it's an incredible metropolis of change. It's a very, very interesting place at the intersection of lots of different economies. And it's changing massively. It's changing super, super fast. It's a very, very young country, only 45 years old. On the left, you see uh, Dubai in 1970-something. And on the right, you see Dubai in 2000-something. It's changed overnight. And so as a place, as a situation to explore what the future is, um, and how decisions are being made that pull us into the future, Dubai is a really, really interesting, um, interesting context. This has happened in 
two or three generations from a world of pearl divers that are living in mud huts to a world of super, super billionaires who are driving Ferraris every day as if it's nothing. Um, this is also, uh, it's rooted deeply in their culture. It's a culture of progress. It's a culture of change. They want to leapfrog other cultures and draw from them. And a lot of that comes from this chap here, um, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, because this is this is not the same kind of political system that we live in. This is a a, a benevolent kind of um, monarchy. Uh, things get over implemented overnight. He's deciding something, and it happens. And I've watched eight-lane motorways be lifted up, and a, like a huge river be built underneath them in the matter of like five or six weeks. Something that in Britain, I can tell you, would take about 50 years. So um, his idea is rather than uh, responding to technology and trying to uh, figure out how to uh, change with the technology that's appearing, he's wanting to drive forward proactively and figure out what future we want to create using technology, how to steer technology. And so this was, uh, this was our opportunity. He asked us to pull the future forward faster. As part of that innovation drive, um, we've been creating this thing that we've called the Museum of the Future. And it's about future foresight. It's about strategic planning. It's about designing and prototyping and figuring out how to communicate what these futures might be um, in the form of uh, plausible future scenarios. So this is, this is prototyping. It's a tool for planning better. It's an, it's an idea for how to get the, these concepts out of abstract PowerPoint slides and reports and into experiences that we can feel so that people remember and so forth. And it's a very, very difficult job, actually. What we realized is that to be, like the future can't be predicted. All we know is what we see around us. We know the technologies uh, that might happen. We can extrapolate from these mega trends which are existing around us, like mass migration and artificial intelligence. But what we also know is that humans are humans. And so we need to also take into account what humans want in this. And so for us, it starts with an ethnography. How do we look at, uh, the humans that exist in this equation and build futures which we know people are going to need. So we pulled together uh, a, a very diverse group of experts and non-experts to try and work out from lots of different worldviews what these futures might be like and how we can extrapolate meaningfully towards something we want to inhabit together. And then this thing is held at the, at the World Government Summit, which is a budding version of the World Economic Forum in Davos every year. And a group of world leaders from that region come together and talk about how their governments are going to move towards the next thing, whatever that is, a greater economy, like a shift away from oil or, uh, and so forth. So it's a perfect moment to get into their heads and, and have like the very uh, upper crust of that society rethink what the future could be and how technology is going to influence our lives. And so I'm going to go through a few of these things that we've been thinking about, because this has been now four years that we've done this exhibition, but actually it's like a, it's a very diverse group of subjects. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, talk about, yeah, the kind of experiences we created. And we looked at healthcare as one of the first things we, we had, uh, approached. What are the qualities of healthcare in this techno-utopian future of Dubai? Well, it's preventative. We're moving from a reactionary healthcare system to one which is... Uh, distributed. Um, there's a there's a holistic <laughs> there's a there's a there's a holistic aspect to it. So taking into account your entire life rather than just like the the moment in which you're ill, we're thinking about like how to change your lifestyle to make it more healthy. And so we created these kind of moments where. Um, healthcare systems can interject in your life. We're imagining a bathroom in which you have an unobtrusive biometric scanner that gives you uh, nudges into a more healthy life and, and it tells you that actually um, there's a cold in your workplace today, it's contagious, so perhaps it adds automatically vitamin C into your breakfast so that you can start fending this stuff off. Or it tells you that um, you should go for a run today because the air pollution is low. Uh, we noticed that obesity is the number... Uh, no, I don't know why that's not playing. Yeah, obesity is the number one um, problem in the, in the UAE for healthcare. And so we invented a mall game, which, was a, which is where people lived their lives in Dubai. That space is, of course, a very social, active place. Um, 
that can actually diagnose them and make them healthy again, takes measurements on how able your body is and feeds that into this holistic healthcare system, like your blood pressure and your range of motion, your hand-eye coordination and so forth. We have this pharma cafe, which is taking the idea of the social space of the cafe and turning it into a treatment zone. So rather than having to go to the doctor, this is part of your everyday life. It's part of the hospitality that the Dubai economy affords already. It's a cross between a, a pharmacy and a juice bar. And also a modern apothecary where synthetically engineered plants are bred to produce high concentrations of botanical chemicals to help you with your, um, your ailments. More broadly, um, thinking about how human bodies are going to change in the, in the realm of technology. What about human agency? Like, are we going to be able to choose our lives going forward? How much control do we have over our lives? So we explored a silicon future where we have electromechanical augmentation of our body starting to play, take place, mixing with artificial intelligence and predictive algorithms. What does that give us? The human body is something that can be mediated. It's something that could be mechanized. We have ro uh, robotics infiltrating our bodies, as we've already seen. Uh, we have networked capabilities, so connectivity in our bodies um, as well. And so we created this personal augmentation spa, which is kind of like the Apple store of the future in which you uh, get to experience what some of these augmentations might be like. It's about trying them on using virtual reality and figuring out how your senses are going to be augmented, how um, your life will change when it's being upgraded with all of these little technological augmentations. So for example, um, we had this idea of downstream, which is about dreaming socially, kind of like an inception space in which your dreams are connected with other people, a, a second social uh, space for us or clairvigilant, which is a kind of um, LiDAR halo for your body, which allowed you to be much more uh, aware of the, your surroundings. And we created some advertisements which communicated these things. So these are pretty out there concepts, but... Are you bored at work? Are you sick of watching the action from afar? Introducing iShare by Do. iShare is the newest social network for distributed sensation. It gives you the ability to broadcast exactly what you are seeing to your friends or colleagues. Or you can tune right into the eyes and ears of others. With iShare, you can see through others' eyes. Tune into the iStream today for a new view on life. By using the iShare network, you grab... <laughs> so, trying to imagine what these new products and services might be like and how they might augment our lives. So, the idea of new what needs... What makes you feel alive? Exploring the farthest reaches of the globe? Pushing the limits of what is possible? Keeping up with or even wearing out your grandkids? New Knees is the new skeletal muscular implant that gives you the ability to perform extraordinary physical feats. So we also have Mood View, which is a way of boosting your social intelligence. Have you ever wondered what people really think about you? Have you ever had trouble convincing people of your ideas? Well, despair no more. Introducing Mood View the most advanced social intelligence product on the market. MoodView's sensitive facial micro-expression recognition reveals people's subconscious feelings and attitudes in real time. The MoodView social coach then draws from a data bank of over 450 trillion social interactions to suggest the best way to respond. Thanks to MoodView, you can read people like an open book and be sure that you say the right thing at the right time, every time. MoodView. See how people really feel. Mood view will not be held responsible for So some of these ideas are taking directly how Silicon Valley might imagine a future using these technologies and how realistically what these information systems know about us already and how they might be offered to us back as products and services. But it might not be the kind of future that we want. And the idea is that we start questioning these things. How is domestic space going to change? What happens when domestic space becomes sentient and augmented and is able to feel for you and empathize with what you're thinking? So we created this projection map space in which AI can take on multiple roles. Maybe it's designed to be a cute child that is attached to you like a, a puppy and uh, excitedly greets you as you come through the door and invites you to take part in games to um, reinforce your bond through play, for example. What is it?
it going to be like when artificial intelligence is going to be in our homes? What if it takes on the role of a spouse or a partner and starts to ask you how you feel when you got home from work and treat you to a relaxing massage to help lower your blood uh, pressure? I feel like I need that sometimes. <laughs> This is a robotically actuated chair, which kind of is, is part of the space around you. It, it, it's a holistically designed space in which the artificial intelligence is controlling your experience. It knows what you want in advance. And what happens when we allow uh, artificial intelligences into our lives to start to take care of our loved ones and the most vulnerable in our society? Do we feel happy giving up our agency and allowing those uh, robot beings to take the place of a human? I'm not sure I would put my kid in that, in that uh, cot there, but maybe it can do a better job than I am when I'm up all night writing presentations. Um, and what happens at a higher level with governance when governance is all around us, it knows every single data point. When it has an ethical framework, it has to make decisions about our laws and our, the ways that, um, yeah, for example, mobility. What happens when that, uh, that culture of uh, fault is taken away and the driver no longer has responsibility for his own actions? And it's algorithmic. It's able to be predictive. It's able to make decisions on the fly. And so we created this incredible kind of sci-fi vision of what a the government of the future might be like, showing swirling data points which are being calculated in real time and making decisions on the fly uh, in, in place of humans, in place of councils, in place of politicians. And it, and it gave you a, a job interview. It showed you um, key, key performance indicators of his actions, but also it, it kind of, it, sh it, it gave you the impression that you were still in control but actually, it was giving you a job interview and it was deciding for you your place in society and what your life was going to be for, what its purpose was. And so how did government leaders feel when they were actually reduced to uh, just being told what they should do? And we took this to the World Economic Forum as well and transformed this into, a, into an exhibition about how our, re our responsibility as politicians is going to change from something which is about making specific decisions about law and about uh, the economy and finance and so on, to something which is actually about creating a moral framework based on human values um, that we can teach the artificial intelligence. We're tending the AI garden rather than, and helping it grow in the right way rather than controlling everything um, around us. And of course, we had this amazing team of people to make these things happen, but creating uh, futures was, was something that we really, really valued and something we learned a lot from. For us, futures are a massive, uh, powerful mode of critique. We can critique the world today when we're extrapolating out into the future and seeing what the impact of these technologies is going to be like. We can think about whether we're making the right decisions all the time. They're a force of change. If we're aspirational about our futures, we can shape the, the future that we're going to inhabit. We can use them as a point of discussion. Because if we are able to transform our collective imagination, we're able to transform what future is going to be. You know, we, we're all here making decisions about what, our, what future we want to inhabit. So how do we do that? Um, and for us, that's about making stuff immersive. It's about, stuff, it's about making things tangible and visceral and real so you can walk into these spaces and feel what they're going to be like. We're, we're talking about going from really abstract ideas to testing the realization of these uh, future concepts through creating real spaces that you can touch and feel and interact with as if they're real. And so for us, prototyping is a big part of that, working with today's technologies to manifest tomorrow's experiences. And this is a really in-depth process. It requires, it requires real experimentation because we're trying to create a, a scenography which is where every single touch point tells a story. Everything that you, everything that you look at has a reason for, it, it, tells us, it, it can be unpacked and its place in this world has a, has a very uh, significant um, message. Uh, and also uh, for creating a space for people to interact with each other and have conversations, um, it can be a very, very powerful mode of uh, debate and discussion which we've seen infiltrate the rest of the um, government. 
And this guy, of course, is, is Sheikh Mohammed himself. He's, he's, the, he's the main decision maker because when you're targeting people's emotions, actually that's how they make decisions. So we're trying to really influence these, these decision makers. But beyond that, we found that uh, for the rest of our clients, it's given us the idea of working with futures has given us this tool set for navigating this situation we find ourselves in of VUCA. There are all of these tools of futurism and future studies which we didn't even know existed as designers that help us navigate what, these, the, what this, this uncertainty is. How do we actually extrapolate beyond making big abstract claims about what the future might be? We need to be specific. We need to be driven to understanding specific scenarios. And the bottom right-hand one is really, really our favorite because it's a Stuart Candy model where we are creating experiences down to stuff. So yes, objects might not, oh, you're talking about creating experiences and objects might have not have the same relevance generally in the future, but stuff is how we experience the world today. Like to be able to hold it and touch it, our perception of reality is still physical. So by making things physical, we can help, uh, help people unpack what these futures might be. And it's given us this new design method. It's helped us understand that actually long-term strategy and near-term product development can combine into this new thing we've started to describe as applied futures, where on the left-hand side of this diagram here, we've got all of the innovation techniques. We've got um, near-term product design, which is pushing new technologies and new ideas for products out into the future using tactics and concrete proposals for what these things could be. But on the right-hand side, we've got these really long-range design fiction uh, and, and strategy ideas, how we are speculating on the future and imagining what these things could be. How do we exist in the middle here and actually put forward prototypes that explore these long-range um, uh, speculations, but also uh, proposing interesting solutions? And how do we apply that elsewhere? So for automotive, one of, the most, uh, one of our favorite projects that we've done is this concept car for Toyota. Um, which, which gave us a mode of exploring and prototyping, ultimately communicating to a wider public an alternate vision for the future um, that they wanted to explore. For them, mobility, autonomous mobility wasn't just about self-driving cars. It was about creating a new kind of relationship with your driver. It was about creating that kind of driving experience in which your car was your friend. It, it, was, a, it was a car that was in dialogue with you all the time. It had a personality and it communicated with you through ambient light and sound and haptic cues and other things that products are going to use in the world of artificially intelligent um, and pervasive uh, technology. So this goes from like a long-term strategy and from a near-term product development into a mid-term speculative future prototype that's very, very powerful. So I've got to wrap up because I've only got a few minutes. And I've got to take a drink. But how do we make the future? Um, it's not just whether we want this future. It's not just what future do we want. It's also how do we make the future? And so for me, what I'm realizing is that it's not just about thinking, it's not abstract, it's not about speculating on these really out there ideas, it's about making the stuff of the world. And as designers, whether we're architects or interior designers or product designers or graphic designers, we're making the stuff that people interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's that stuff which defines the world around us. It's that stuff that we understand will make a better future for ourselves. And so thinking back in time about how we've made stuff in the past, we are realizing that um, even in years gone by, uh, back in the days where you have these craftspeople, um, the artist and the craftsman and the technician were embodied in the old days into this um, tradesperson who learned from an, as an apprentice from his master and spent thousands of hours working with the materials of his time to design, to imagine, design, and build uh, all in a one -er. He was working hands-on with these materials. Uh, through the industrial ages where the artist and craftsman became separated somewhat from the technologies of the time because these, this, um, the tools that they were using, these machine tools to form these complex machines become so technical that they weren't able to understand it all. And so they started working separately with technicians. Um, and, and they ceased working directly hands-on with these materials. You know? like, and so as these patterns emerged, uh, over the last like few hundred years, we're starting to see, of course, software and extremely diverse, uh, deep areas of expertise, which are becoming more complex, more opaque, less easy to work with, 
um, and less knowable? Like, and how, as designers, do we design with materials that are less knowable? How do we put stuff out into the world when there's no real way of understanding them as materials? For, and for us, data and software and connectivity has always been treated as a material. We like to think of ourselves as industrial designers who grew up in the 90s. We saw this amazing digital transformation where software inhabited the physical objects and had to be integrated, not just layered on top of each other, but also made it synthesized together into a single experience um, that was at once object and behavior. And going further, what is that going to be like in the future? Um, this isn't just wood and metal anymore. This is, a, this, is about, uh, this is about more complex things. And when you look out into the future, if you're not familiar, you should look at the Gartner hype cycle. This shows, uh, this shows the, a kind of map of emerging technologies as they arrive onto our horizon. How do we pick any technology on that uh, hype cycle and understand what its material properties are like? How, do, how does it feel? We don't know. These things are really, really out there. We haven't explored them yet. If you think about synthetic biology, this poor sheep has been designed by the um, Animal Reproduction Institute of Uruguay to be glow in the dark. It's a fluorescent sheep. Like this is this is this is the stuff that's happening. And yet these things aren't things that we can design with yet. We don't understand the material nature of these these processes. How does transgenic how are transgenic animals produced? How do we work with those materials? And this stuff is still the confines of bioengineering labs. This is, we are having wet labs. We're playing with these things. We're trying to understand where we can interact with them. But ultimately, this is still really, really out there. And it's the same with artificial intelligence. It's a black box. Even the people who are designing these complex systems don't know how they work. So how as designers who are in automotive, who are in industrial design, work with something which is just a black box? You put something in, and you get something out, and you don't know how that happened. Um, how do we figure out those properties to work with? And so we're realizing that as, as designers, we have an incredible um, responsibility here. We are very well placed to become facilitators in between a massive, wide, um, a, array of deep, diverse uh, expertise in some form of networked group. And so figuring out how to make material these very, very abstract things is what we figure our business is. And that inhabits all kinds of areas, of course. But ultimately, it's about human values. It comes back to the human and what our needs are and what values we want to, to see in the products and services around us whether it's a government service or a new form of mobility or a retail experience, what could, the, what could the retail experience of the future be like? It isn't just about efficiency. It's not just about maximizing profits because those are the places that end up in dystopian sci-fi futures. It's about creating a future which, has, which exhibits our human values. We're, we're trying to create a future which isn't about technology versus humanity. It's about bringing those things together really meaningfully. So finding the material properties of the future and materializing those things is what we do as designers. And so I find that an extremely optimistic statement. Like it's empowering. It makes you realize that it's at our, finger, our fingertips. And all of us in the room here today, in every way that we are able, should be considering that um, our jobs. And I'll just end on a project uh, that we've been doing to help us understand how the nature of design is, is changing. And we've interviewed uh, like 50 odd uh, elite designers in the world to get their perspectives on what this means for our practice as designers. And this guy, Kevin Slavin, who, is, uh, who runs uh, the Media Lab in MIT, uh, has this to say. It's a important responsibility to provide the rest of us with an imagination for this world that scientists haven't yet described. <laughs> so, please help us. I want to do these kind of projects. <laughs> and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. That's on the one hand very frightening, the picture that you paint. On the other hand, it's quite uh, seductive. Um, on which end are you at the moment? I am extremely optimistic that if we learn how to work with these materials, we can make an incredible future using these technologies. I think that artificial intelligence will make all our lives better. It will change our, the nature of our jobs, just as the industrial era changed the nature of our jobs. But I do think that 
if we figure out how to build these ethical frameworks and uh, human values and human needs into these technologies rather than just allowing the technology to define that for us, we'll end up in a much better place. That's, bright, uh, that's quite a, a strict condition you put down there. It's our, well, I mean... But if you speak about Elon Musk not knowing in which direction uh, technology will be going, and if you speak about uh, the Sheikh Mohammed being uh, the most powerful man of Dubai and being able to... I don't hear myself anymore, so I don't know if you hear me. But uh, in any case, uh, we'll continue uh, being able to kind of work on sen future scenarios that uh, maybe are uh, seductive to him, but not to the rest of the humanity. But I think that I think that if you look at Elon Musk, I think what he's doing is he's he's uh, he's changing. He's trying to change the things that he understands how to change that he has a vision for, like electric cars and. Um, finding the affordances of space travel and what does that do for us. He's really, really visionary and, and motivating and able to compel us into a future that he can imagine. And where he doesn't know the answer, he says, I don't know the answer, but this is a problem that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's what we have to take from also from uh, dystopian sci-fi as well. It's, it's not about like saying the future's terrible. It's about critiquing the future in order for us to make it better. And so I think as long as we live our lives with that optimism and um, figure out like what we, we take seriously, what we can all do in our responsibility to have impact where we can, uh, keeping in mind that ultimately it's about the preservation of our quality of life and the preservation of our future generations and what they, how they are going to live their lives. Are they going to have enough food to eat? Are they going to be, you know, uh, is there going to be tons of disease? Like going back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have to look after ourselves. Um, and so how we figure out how to work with this technology is, is what it's all about. It's about it's about being optimistic and being active and placing things into the world that we believe in. I once heard that uh, Dubai has a ministry of happiness. Yeah, it does, yeah. Well, actually, it's funny because... But that's that's quite hopeful, I think. Yeah, well, actually, the minister of happiness is a lady called Ahud, and she is she used to be our client, actually, our client's client, I should say. And I think that we can't take credit for what how that happened and how that materialized, but, like, we did talk about having a ministry of happiness like five years ago now. And it's really, really interesting to see how when you're willing to um, throw down a kind of like a vision of what could be and trigger lots of debate, how it can, how it might end up in changing the status quo. And I don't know whether what we discussed back then ended up why they have a ministry of happiness now, but I like to think that our provocative dis debates that we created mm -hmm just contributed towards that sort of thing happening and broadened their perspectives on what it means to be a government in a, in a situation like Dubai because they have all sorts of problems that need to be solved. Mm -hmm. you know? As do we. As I, do can, we. I can imagine that uh, you have some questions for this guy. Um, feel free to raise your hand and then a colleague of mine will approach you with a microphone. There's one. So, is there... Ah. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I can't hear you. I can't. I'm not wearing headphones. Oh. No. <laughs> now now okay. you're wearing headphones, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> you're not. Okay. No, I need this guy at the back here to switch on these dudes. Hmm. Or you could just shout. I can shout if you, you want. You can shout. I can hear yeah. you now. Yeah. Um, your lecture is having extreme openness. What do you think of the hopefulness? Yeah. yeah hopefulness. Yeah. Good. Yeah. The motive in history, I just heard the lecture before, I can't talk about future developments. Yeah. Can you talk about the future if you can't talk about future developments? And what do you think about the enclosedness of the automotive industry? The, the, the closed loop sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, actually, it's a really good point. And um, 
one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about material properties of design is because a lot of the work that we do, um, we can't talk about either. You know, it's, it's, if you look at our website, a lot of companies think of us as ex exhibition designers because that's like the stuff that we can talk about, but we're also working with Google and we're also working with um, Philips and other kind of big manufacturing companies like Toyota. Like we're lucky to be able to show that on our website. It's really, really difficult. And I think that, the, that there is a developing um, uh, community of, uh, or there's a developing set of values for placing technologies out there into the world for people to ex uh, experiment with and to position views. But it, there's always going to be a difficult balance in commerce as to what you keep in house and what you keep out of house. You know, um, for example, TensorFlow, Google is Google has placed a, an artificial intelligence platform out into the world open sourced it completely, and you can build whole offerings using this, uh, using this platform. I think that like, um, more and more companies are being open about what they want to do, but also um, willing to put their visions for what the future might be up for public scrutiny. And I think Toyota's, a, like the, the Dubai government, that was public, but also the Toyota um, uh, concept car, that was public. I think that um, it's going to be less and less about brands saying brands like saying how they think you should act and buy in order to make more money and more about brands saying how they think the world could be better and have people buy into that future um, actively. And so I'd like to see more of that and I'd like to help uh, companies understand how they can do that. I, I should say that a large part of what we do, although we're doing research and we're doing product development and we're designing exhibitions, a large part of it is about communicating really complex ideas. And so finding ways for companies to communicate their ideas is critical. And for us, that often means experiences. So that's what I believe. We'll see if it comes true. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I'm afraid time is up. We have to move on to the next speaker. Uh, your best applause for Paul Skinner, please. Thank you very Give much. Give it up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. You can, uh, you can 